Ananda said to the Buddha, "Won't honored one, the first come one has often spoken of the mystery of union and causes and conditions, saying that the transformations of everything in the world are created from the mixing and uniting of the four elements. Why does the first come one reject causes and conditions and spontaneity as well? I do not know how to understand your meaning now. Please be so compassionate as to instruct us, living beings, in the final meaning of the middle way, in the dramas which are not ego theories. The world honored one then told Ananda, "You have renounced the small vehicle dramas of the south hearers and those enlightened to conditions, and have resolved." To diligently seek unsurpassed body, because of that, I will now explain the foremost truth to you. Why do you still bind yourself up in the ego theories and false thoughts current among people of the world? Although you are very learned, you are like someone who can discuss medicines but cannot distinguish a real medicine when it is placed before you. The first common says that you are truly beautiful. Listen attentively now as I explain this point in detail for you and also for those of the future who cultivate the great vehicle, so that you all can penetrate to the real appearance. Ananda was silent and awaited the Buddha's holy instruction. Ananda, according to what you said. The mixing and uniting of the four elements create the myriad transformations of everything in the world. Ananda, if the nature of those elements does not mix and unite in substance, then they cannot combine with other elements, just as empty space cannot combine with forms. Assuming that they do mix and unite, they are then only in a process of transformation in which. They depend on one another for existence from beginning to end. In the course of transformation, they are produced and extinguished, being born and then dying, dying and then being born, in birth after birth, in death after death. The way a, a torch, a torch spun in a circle, forms an unbroken wheel of flame. Ananda, the process is like water becoming ice and ice becoming water again. Consider the nature of earth. Its coarse particles make up the great earth. Its fine particles make up most of dust, down to and including most of dust bordering upon emptiness. If one divides those fine most of dust, their appearance is at the boundaries of form. They divide, then divide those into seven parts. Ananda, if this mode of dust bordering upon emptiness is divided, and it becomes emptiness, it should be that emptiness can give rise to form. Just now, you asked if mixing and uniting doesn't bring about the transformations of everything in the world. You should carefully consider how much emptiness mixes and unites to make a single mote of dust bordering upon emptiness. Since it makes no sense to say that dust bordering on emptiness is composed of dust bordering on emptiness. Moreover, since most of dust bordering upon emptiness can be reduced to emptiness, of how many moles of Such a form as this must emptiness be composed. When this mass of form mass together, a mass of form does not make emptiness. When emptiness is massed together, a mass of emptiness does not make form. Besides, although form can be divided, how can emptiness be massed together? You simply do not know that in the treasury of the first common, the nature of form. Is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true form. Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It occurs with living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated 
by the law of karma. Ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions, or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words, which have no real meaning. Ananda fire, which has no nature of its own, depends upon various causes and conditions for its existence. Consider a family of the city that has not yet eaten. When they wish to prepare food, they hold up a speculum to the sun, seeking fire. Ananda, let us look into your suggestion that the fire comes forth from mixing and uniting. By way of example, you and I and the 1250 bishops unite together to form a community. However, a careful analysis of the community reveals that every member composing it has his own body, birthplace, clan, and name. For instance, Shariputra is a Brahman, Yuruvilva is of the Kashya Park clan and Jiu Ananda come from the Gautama family. Ananda supposed fire existed because of mixing and uniting. When the hand holds up the speculum to the sun, seeking fire, to seek fire, does a fire come out of the speculum? Does it come out of the moksha tinder or does it come from the sun? Suppose, Ananda, that it came from the sun, not only would it burn the moksha tinder in your hand, but as it came across the groves of trees, it should burn them up as well. Suppose that it came from the speculum, since it came out from within the speculum to ignite the moksha tinder, why doesn't the speculum melt? Yet your hand that holds it feels no feet. How then could the speculum melt? Suppose that the fire came from the Mopsa tinder, then why is fire generated only when the bright mirror comes into contact with the dazzling light? Furthermore, on closer examination, you will find the speculum held in hands the sun high up in the sky and the mobs are grown from the ground. Where does the fire come from? How can it travel some distance to reach here? The sun and the speculum cannot mix and unite since they are far apart from each other. Nor can it be that the fire exists spontaneously without an origin. You simply do not know that in the treasury of the first common, the nature of fire is true emptiness and the nature of emptiness is true fire. Pure at its origin, it pervades the drama realm. It occurs with living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. Ananda, you should know that fire is generated in the place where the speculum is held up to the sunlight and fire will be generated everywhere if Specula are held up to the sunlight throughout the Dharma realm. Since fire can come forth throughout the whole world, can there be any fixed place to which it is confined? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Ignorant of it, this fact, People in the world are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. Ananda, water is by nature unstable. It may keep on flowing or come to a stop. Kapila, Chakra, Padma, and Hasta, and other great magicians of Shravasti often hold up instruments to the light of the full moon at midnight to extract 
from the moon the essence of water to mix with their drugs. Does the water come out of the crystal ball? Does it exist of itself in space or does it come from the moon? Ananda supposed the water came from the distant moon. Water then should also flow from all the grass and trees when the moonlight passes over them on its way to the crystal ball. If it does flow from them, why wait for it to come out of the crystal ball? If it does not flow from the trees, then it is clear that the water does not descend from the moon. If it came from the crystal balls, then it should flow from the crystal all the time. Why would they have to wait for midnight and the light of the full moon to receive it? If it came from space, which is by nature boundless, it would flow everywhere until everything between earth and sky was submerged. How then could there still be traveled by water, land and space? Furthermore, upon closer examination, you will find that the moon moves through the sky, the crystal ball is held in the, the hand, and the pan for receiving the water is put there by someone. But where does the water that flows into the pan come from? The moon and the crystal balls cannot mix or unite since they are far apart nor can it be that the essence of water exists spontaneously without an origin. You still do not know that in the treasury of the first common the nature of water is true emptiness and the nature of emptiness is true water. Pure in its origin, it pervades the drama realm. It occurs with living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. A crystal ball is held up at a certain place and their water comes forth. If crystal balls were held up throughout the drama realm, then throughout the drama realm water would come forth, since water can come forth throughout the entire world. Can there be any fixed place to which it is confined? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign their origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind are nothing but the ploy of empty words which have no real meaning. Ananda, by nature, the wind has no substance and its movements and stillness are erratic. You always adjust your rope as you enter the great assembly. When the corner of your samgati brushes the person next to you, there is a slight breeze which stirs against that person's face. Does this wind come from the corner of the kashaya? Does it arise from emptiness, or is it produced from the face of the person brushed by the wind? Ananda, if the wind comes from the corner of the kashaya, you are then clad in the wind and your kashaya should fly about and leave your body. I am now speaking Dharma in the midst of the assembly and my rope remains motionless and hangs straight down. You should look closely at my rope to see whether there is any wind in it. It cannot be that the wind is stored somewhere in the rope either. If it arose from emptiness, why wouldn't the wind brush against the man even when your rope did not move? Emptiness is constant in nature, thus the wind should constantly arise. When there was no wind, the emptiness should disappear. You can perceive the, the disappearance of the wind, but what would the dis disappearance of emptiness look like? If it did arise and disappear, it could not be what is called emptiness. Since it is what is called emptiness, how can it generate wind? If the wind came from the face of the person by your side, 
it would blow up on you while you set your rope in order. Why would it blow backwards upon the person from whom it was generated? Upon closer examination, you will find that the rope is set in order by yourself. The, fla the face blown by the wind belongs to the person by your side, and the emptiness is tranquil and not involved in movement. Where, then, does the wind come from that blows in this place? The wind and emptiness cannot mix and unite since they are different from each other. Nor should it be that the wind spontaneously exists without an origin. You still do not know that in the treasury of the first common the nature of wind is true emptiness and the nature of emptiness is true wind. Pure at its origin, it pervades the drama realm. It occurs with living beings, mice, in response to their capacity to know. Ananda, in the same way that you, as one person, move your rope slightly and a small wind arises, so a wind arises in all countries if there is a similar movement throughout the Dharma realm since it can be produced throughout the world. How can there be any fixed place to which it is confined? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign their origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which bear no real meaning. Ananda, the nature of emptiness has no shape. It is only apparent because of form. For instance, Shravasti is far from the river, so when the Shachiyas, Brahmans, Vaishyas, Shudras, Bharat, Vayas, Chandalas, and so forth build their homes there, they dig wells seeking water. Where a foot of earth is removed, there is a foot of emptiness, where as many as ten feet of earth are removed, there are ten feet of emptiness. The depth of the emptiness corresponds to the amount of earth removed. Does this emptiness come out of the dirt? Does it exist because of the digging? Or does it arise of itself without a cause? Moreover, Ananda, suppose this emptiness arose of itself without any cause. Why wasn't it unobstructed before the earth was dug? Quite the, the contrary, one saw only the great earth, there was no emptiness evident in it. If emptiness came about because of the removal of the earth, we should have seen it entering the well as the earth was removed. If emptiness was not seen entering the well when the earth was first removed, how can we say that emptiness came about because of the removal of the earth? If there is no going in or coming out, then there is no difference between the earth and emptiness. Why then does an emptiness come out of the well along with the earth in the process of digging? If emptiness appeared if because of the digging, then the digging would bring out emptiness instead of the earth. If emptiness does not come out because of the digging, then the digging yields only earth. Why then do we see emptiness appear as the well is dark? You should consider this even more carefully. Look into it deeply and you will find that the digging comes from the person's hand as its means of conveyance, and the earth exists because of a change in the ground. But what causes the emptiness to appear? The digging and the emptiness, one being substantial and the other insubstantial, do not function on the same plane. They do not mix and unite. 
nor can it be that emptiness exists spontaneously without an only dream. Also, the nature of emptiness is completely pervasive. It is basically unmoving. You should know that it and earth, water, fire, and wind are together called the five elements. Their natures are true and perfectly fused, and all are the treasury of the first common, fundamentally devoid of production and extinction. Ananda, your mind is murky and confused, and you do not awaken to the fact that the source of the four elements is none other than the treasury of the first come one. Why do you not take a look at emptiness to see whether it is subject to such relativities as coming and going? You do not know at all that in the treasury of the first come one, the nature of enlightenment is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true enlightenment. Through what is origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It occurs with living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. Ananda, if in one place there is a well empty of earth, there will be emptiness filling up that one place. If there are wells empty of earth in the ten directions, there will be emptiness filling them up in the ten directions. Since it fills up the ten directions, is there any fixed location in which emptiness is found? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign their origin to causes and conditions, or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which bear no real meaning.